Hello and welcome back to the Bright Founders Talk podcast from Temi. Temi is an international software development company that designs, builds, and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. My name is Chris, and today's guest is someone who is a true entrepreneur, having obtained a thorough understanding of finance, media, and technology along the way, and now the co-founder of an extremely successful company called Macadamia. Estelle Lloyd, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Very well. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So I've got a couple of questions, uh, like we normally ask all the guests. So what is your favorite productivity hack while you're working from home? Great question. Um, I mean, I am finding working from home actually quite challenging, much more than I was expecting, um, only because there's actually a lot of distractions. Um, and to begin with, I found it really, really hard actually to be very focused. I, I actually thought it was going to be the opposite and everybody was saying, oh, you know, I'm so much more productive at home. Um, for me, I am, I think, broadly more productive at home, but I also find that I can be distracted more easily. My productivity hack is actually a weird one. I have a dog and I take frequent breaks and I just go and hang out with my dog for a few minutes. I find it really helpful to sort of reset and you know, find like a grounding presence. Um, so that's my maybe unusual productivity hack. <laughs> yeah, that's why I know it's interesting. So you you have like a specific room where you work and then the rest of the yes. time just so you break yes. up. Exactly. Just when I need a bit of a break, I go and see my dog, who is lovely. <laughs> um, second question, what is something new that you would like to learn away from work, outside of work? Work has been really interesting for us because we've embraced artificial intelligence. So I just want to mention it here because it's been, I've actually been spending a lot of time and it's been actually um, stilling outside of work as well. So I've, I've been really fascinated by everything that I've been reading. So I've actually been spending a lot of time outside of work on this. Um, one thing that I want to do this year outside of work is I want to start singing again. I want to start singing lessons. Um, I think that there is a very uh, joyful joyfulness in singing. I think that it's really difficult to make it um, not joyful, uh, even if you're singing quite a sad piece, you know, it's, it's just the whole experience I find really mindful. Is that something you could incorporate with your employees in terms of, I don't know, a stress relieving karaoke session? Could you think oh, it could be? Yeah. So karaoke is a very dividing topic in our company. Some, you know, we have, I would say 50% of um, my team love it and would just do that on team events and 50% just hate it and would not like go near a mic. So I haven't yet found a way to convince everyone. I, I'm obviously embracing it. I think you already understood that. <laughs> but <laughs> I agree. Um, I'm on that side as well. I think it's yeah. a great way to bring people together and also... Absolutely. Yeah. And the final warm-up question is, what did you want to be growing up? So I wanted to be many things, but one thing that I really wanted to be throughout my um, sort of teenager, teenage years was a professional skier. So I grew up skiing. My dad was a ski instructor and a skier, a competitive skier um, in a competitive team. And I just loved it. I loved the, I'm a very competitive person. So I love, I, I loved competing. Um, and I also liked being in the mountains. Uh, this has stuck with me. I d did a lot of work in my career around climate change and uh, clean tech, clean technology. And that's where it comes from. Spending so much time, you know, mm. in the mountains is just very special. So I went into a professional skier, um, but I didn't qualify, which was a bit of a bummer, but um, I still ski today. It's one of my favorite things to do. Not so okay. not so easy in the UK, but... It is not in the... <laughs> so it is some indoor places, right? I'm not sure around London where you are now, but I remember in Manchester there was an indoor slope. But yeah. again, it's no, I've never tried this, but maybe, why not? Keep it um, in mind. Thanks, Sorry, brilliant. Um, so I want to just sort of go back and um, start off by thinking about your education. And I thought it was very interesting because you have a bachelor's degree, a master's and an MBA. So I just wanted to know what was your experience in further education? I assume that you enjoyed it and you felt like it was something you you needed. Was there a good also was there a good mix of theory and practical on those courses? Yes. Um I left investment banking because I wanted to become an entrepreneur. Um that was in the early 2000 and I really didn't know how to do that. 
Um, the great thing about investment banking is that I was I had a very good familiarity with businesses, business models. So I've worked in technology, media, and, and telecom for uh, for many years. I, I really understood how businesses work, but I didn't. I, I I was struggling to find that impulse of you know finding a passion, going for something. Um, and so I decided to apply to Columbia University, and I did an executive MBA, which was a fascinating experience and a perfect balance of lectures and also hands-on, you know, meeting uh, people coming into the um, program, talking about their careers, talking about their experiences. And I obviously particularly enjoyed anything to do with entrepreneurship. Um, I took all of the options around that and all the classes, the electives, and that's where it all started. So, yeah. Is that is that something that you, like you say, you were, you were kind of interested in becoming an entrepreneur so did you have to kind of that was the extra stuff that you were just pushing yourself towards or was it something that you had to do um integrated in your course like networking and meeting sort of um I don't know I mean it wasn't really like you know an MBA is a pretty broad degree so it's not really the core program is not really geared to entrepreneurship and I just want to say you don't have to do an MBA to be an entrepreneur that's also what I learned you know although you know, I had a fantastic experience intellectually. It's, it's a brilliant program. It's a brilliant, brilliant university to be a part of. I I actually don't think it's necessary to do an MBA to be an entrepreneur, far from it. A lot of brilliant entrepreneurs have never done one. Um, but for me, um, I did not have that sense of security. And the one thing also that I realized is that when you work for a large corporate like you do when you are in a big investment bank, you're very siloed and you end up thinking that the only thing that you can do is, you know, the job that you're doing and that there is no other alternative. And I think I had to unlearn more than anything. I think my MBA was more about as much about unlearning than it was about gaining confidence and throwing myself out there. I should say that I, even before I went into investment banking, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, which is when you ask the question, what did you want to do when you were growing up? I really wanted to be a professional skier because I wanted to win. But I also always, I know now, always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to have an IT and take it all the way through. In, in terms of this idea, like what well, I think... It's the same in the UK from my experience, and I often mention this with other entrepreneurs because I think it's very interesting that I think in the UK, it is quite similar to your experience in terms of you're kind of pigeonholed. You're put in that that bracket of, okay, you're, you're, a, you know, you're a, an accountant or something. That's what you're going to do uh, for the rest of your life. Is that the same experience in, in France? And then when you went to the US, did that kind of open up that, that um, thinking more to like, okay, I can do anything? So first of all, I never worked in France, so I have no idea. Um, I went to the US straight after my um, bachelor and I um, went originally there for an internship and I ended up staying close to 10 years. So I would say the US at the time, uh, that was the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, the you know tech bubble. There were a lot more people actually taking steps into entrepreneurship from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, so I experienced that. But you might say that even though I witnessed that and I was part of that ecosystem, I still had that uh, sort of, you know, um, something held me back and I, I needed to, you know, learn some basics, build a network, take some time and think about what I wanted to do. In, I think just to, well, to build on that instead then in terms of, because I think you did your bachelor's, right? And then you went to work for a while. And then you went, like you said, you went and then decided to study uh, a master's and then the MBA or the, you did no, I, my master's in, in I, I did my bachelor and master's in France. Then I went and uh, worked in investment banking for oh, okay. eight years and then did my MBA. I was curious whether during that period, of, you know, when you were in the US working and also doing the MBA, is that, did you obtain any skills that you still use now to this day? Was there anything you picked oh, up that yeah. you still... Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I mean, again, um, you know, 
Working in investment ranking is actually very formative, particularly in what I was doing. So you look at lots of business plans. You really, really go and take, you look at every single aspect of a business, look at not just the financials, but, you know, look at the prospects, you know, the business model, growth plans, and, um, you know, the team, how the team is delivering. So it's, it's, it's actually an incredibly interesting um, career because you get exposed to, you know, so many, you know, case studies. The MBA for me was, as I said, part unlearning and part learning. I think the learning really is, um, you know, reminding yourself the pure basis of management, which I often have this discussion with some members of my team who sometimes are a bit reluctant to go into continuing educations and take courses. And I say to them, you know, business is not common sense. You know, general management, sorry, is not common sense. You have there are there are things that you need to learn, and you you will progress and you know feel a lot better about your job and your interactions with your teams if you do learn them. You know, and I'm a big fan of the Harvard Business Re- Review, which is always my go-to when I I come across something that is a bit of a sticky thing or a point or something that I get asked. And and you know there is some truth to it. There are some. There are some real bases, so some real knowledge that you're much better prepared if you've learned it. So after some time, um, you returned, or you you went to London, sorry, and uh, you got a position as a managing director. Um, how did that come about, and how did you get on in that role? What did you what what did you sort so of I learn? I came back to London to start my first business. So I finished my um, MBA in New York and then at Columbia and then moved to London and started my first company, which was a data research and event company around clean clean energy, which I ran for five years and then sold to a 250 FTSE company called Centro Media. Okay. So um, I was just going to, well, I suppose linked in with that, starting your business then, as well as maybe the manager director role. I, w- I was just curious whether that, gave you the springboard to start the company you have now in terms of, was it kind of, the, the, let's say, the finishing school for you felt like, okay, I'm ready to to take the next step now after moving back to London? As I said, so the first, when I moved to London, I started my first company and that, that was like full on, you know, starting a business. So creating the product, finding product market, market fit, uh, building a team, raising funding, scaling, uh, you know, selling uh, globally, starting another vertical within the business in cybersecurity, which was the second, in you know, uh, vertical that we created after clean energy, clean tech. Um, you know, and that was um, that was very full on. That was a you know proper business. Um, it grew very fast, and then sold it at the right time, um, at the you know moment when you sort of find yourself thinking. Can I continue growing this business, you know, independently on my own? Or is this business going to be thriving and doing much better as part of a larger group uh, where you get economies of scale and uh, access to lots of things, including cheaper capital? And we made that decision. It was the right one. And uh, and so, so after doing that, after selling the business, I stayed with the company that acquired it for under two years and then started my second company which is the one that i'm running today called macademia okay well in terms of just out of interest and the 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 first company you started how much did you scale it before you sold it i mean how how many employees did you have or we ended up being about close to 40 employees um we operated mostly in the uk and the u.s yeah, it was a great, it's great. It, it it was and continues to be a great business. It's uh it's a great space to be in. The at the time when we started, clean tech was only just starting and it was a really exciting space to be in. Um I think that there is much that has happened since then, but um it was very exciting to be part of this uh of this industry at the time when it was was really starting when Government was started to invest meaningfully into the space where you started seeing a real consumer awareness as well about the importance of paying attention to your sources of electricity and energy in the house. That's when we started seeing really the first wind farms, you know, really at scale where you started seeing, um, you know, those huge wind farms on sides of the motorway. And yeah, it was a really exciting journey. 
you, you seem like very well after this a bit of research on yourself you seem like a very altruistic person um i i noticed you've done a lot for um other females in business or other potential entrepreneurs in business as well as other volunteering and you know you you're very concerned about the environment as well do you think it's, it's important for businesses to always have that you know to always give back to society in some way could that be a part of every business model in your opinion well, it's it's definitely very important for me to work with businesses found having found it two businesses that are very much about impact, but also to work with founders who are run businesses that have uh, that are impact driven. Obviously, female entrepreneurship is a big topic for me. I'm I'm a huge supporter, and I do support female entrepreneurs either as an advisor or non executive director. I would say that the only thing that I that worries me sometimes is that when you talk about impact or when you talk about value-driven businesses, often I have noticed that investors in particular or just in general people think that you can't uh, run a very profitable business that will scale very far and also be value-driven and impact-led, um, which is a bit of a... Which is something that I've bumped into, and I've as I've tried to debunk. You know, I, yes, I am uh, very interested in, you know, impact-led businesses, but I do believe that impact-led businesses also can be very solid, very profitable, very successful business models. And it's really important to remind us, um, mm. especially as a female entrepreneur. On the other end, I do a lot of charity work as well. I'm on the board of the NSPCC, and that's obviously completely separate. You know, you're not looking at the same. Uh, you know KPIs on on that front because obviously um, you know it's a charity so the business model is slightly different. I see. You know, I think it's something that more companies have looked into over the past ten or twenty years. But it just I think it's good for you know image of the the brand or company in terms of making them seem more concerned about. Not just selling something or providing a service, but also about you know building a community, which is, I think, is a fairly new thing from my perspective. But um, so with with talking about your company, the co-founder of Macadamia, what do you do? Could you sort of fill us in? What's the goal of Macadamia? Um, so get, uh, Macadamia is a educational entertainment streamer. We have uh, we essentially operate TV channels, uh, streaming apps, and various you know channels. Um, in 22 languages, pretty much globally. And we focus on educational content. So we'll have educational documentaries, programming, even scripted shows. And the DNA of the company is to create a smarter and kinder world. So we look at everything really thinking what is needed right now in the world in terms of education, in terms of uh, learning, in terms of inspiring stories and content for kids and families that that exist out there and we're trying to find it and group it into this channel called Da Vinci and inside the streaming app, the Da Vinci streaming app. Um, it's a fascinating space to be in. There is so much uh, happening at the moment. Um, there are some amazing creators always looking for interesting topics to cover. We are always at the forefront of trying to think about topics that families are interested in learning themselves or making sure that kids are exposed to. So for example, digital literacy, you know, how do you um, behave online? Uh, how do you look after yourself and protect your privacy? You know, what do you do if you're being bullied? You know, how do you uh, become a great citizen uh, in the digital world? So that's one example of some of the topics that we cover, but obviously, and and none of this will surprise you. Or really, really interesting covering the environment, sustainability, climate change mm -hmm. in a non anxiety driven approach. So we try to have programming which is more action driven, and then being sort of doom and gloom. So we try and explain to kids and families how they can play a part at the level day to day in looking after the planet and the environment but that's another example and there are lots of topics that we are always constantly trying to discuss with content creators and producers and even brands who are interested in working with us in creating these types of programming financial literacy is one of them right now financial literacy especially in the current 
economic environment is really important. Nobody really teaches it. Uh, it's not really something that you get taught in school or anywhere else. It's, you know, it's kind of you're expected to know what a mortgage is. You know, it's not as simple. And I think there is great value in teaching kids some root concepts earlier on. We've also recently worked on a fantastic series, which we have produced ourselves. So we produce content. We also buy content from big studios. Uh, so we have a mix of both on our channels. The recent productions, production that we did was called um, Becoming Extraordinary. That's a really good example of the type of programming that we love to have on the Da Vinci channels and streaming app. Um, it's about finding your greatness. It's about um, finding how you can become extraordinary at something if you have found your passion and that everyone can be extra extraordinary. It's a co-production with Bear Grylls. Um, mm. It's based on interviews with big celebrities and amazing people who have been and continue to be at the very top of their fields. So it's interviews with Roger Federer explaining when he decided to become the greatest tennis player of all times, um, Julia Roberts telling us about her career and when she decided to become um, one of the Hollywood's uh, biggest um, movie stars and, and on and on and on. We have Tim Peake, the astronaut, talking to us about how as a little kid he wanted to be an astronaut and the journey wasn't straightforward. No, uh, and imagine. so that's the kind of programming that we... Um, look for and that we make ourselves uh, or we partner with uh, produce producers to to make together mm, that's fascinating i think there's there's a lot lacking let's say in the classroom especially you know in terms of how do you manage your money what are taxes and so on so if you can yeah incorporate that from an early age and in an engaging way have you seen that lots of or are you trying to incorporate your um the the platform into the classroom or is it just something for after school or for home? So, so interestingly, it's it's been mostly after school, but increasingly we are, um, so our go-to-market strategy was to go into direct-to-consumer and also work with partners to put our channels and the streaming app in, in front of uh, people in their homes where they tend to consume streaming apps such as Netflix or Disney+. Plus and also TV channels. So this has been our first you know, port of, port of call. Increasingly, we've been working with teachers and educational platforms that exist in the classroom. And the reason is that what we've talked about, these topics, they do matter in the classroom as well. And also, I think there is a re realization that the non-core curriculum topics are really important and they're really, really hard to teach. Um, and if you can get the kind of support that we provide in terms of making it really engaging, it is gold. Um, and so therefore we are increasingly working with the education system and we have plans to work more and more with, with, um, you know, the attack, the, the educational community and teachers in schools. Mm. Did you, I imagine, I'm just curious you know, in terms of the pandemic, was that something that was actually beneficial for yourselves rather than detrimental for most other businesses, right? Because they had to close, whereas maybe... Absolutely beneficial. Absolutely beneficial. Obviously, um, parents at home trying to find things to do with kids, we, you know, were, were the sort of, you know, obvious choice. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was an interesting time for, for us, um, for sure. Were there, well, were there any, in terms of, you know, starting uh, the business, were there any hiccups that you had to overcome? And obviously, how did you overcome them? Oh, gosh, there are so many hiccups. I don't even know where to begin. Um, so we, we operate in the streaming space, right? So as I'm sure you know, streaming equals, you know, Netflix, Disney+. Plus. I'm just giving you the top two here, but there are many more. Mm -hmm. And they have deep pockets. You know, those are multi billion dollar companies that you know have a lot of firepower to acquire customers so we compete with them you know uh, in some of the in so in many ways we do 
because we go after the same acquisition channel. So we have to be very creative in terms of how we reach our customers. In our case, we've worked with partners that really want to be aligned with our mission and are really interested in providing the customers with a, you know, with with a with a source of educational entertainment that they trust and that they feel good about. So we've worked with large corporates um, across the globe to really be part of their offering and to rely on them to put us in front of the customers. So that translates into the Vodafone Group preloading our app into all of their devices or working with Amazon to have a, an Amazon Prime channel um, on, on Amazon or uh, a lot of the local telcos in Africa work with us as well because they want to give access to that educational content to the communities. So we work with 500 plus partners across the world, so I couldn't list all of them here. But that, that has been how we've grown. That's been how we've we we've glo- grown globally and continue to grow grow globally. And we are finding new partners. Um, you know, every week we we work with a new partner, which is really fascinating. Brilliant. Um, just just about yourself now. Well, as a co-founder, I'm just curious, what did you look for in a good business partner when you started it? What do you know? Do you want someone who compliments you, who challenges you, or what? What do you normally look for? What, what's perfect for you? That is a really interesting question in my case because my co-founder is my husband. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't looking for a co-founder initially, but it just happened. It wasn't planned. Um, and uh, the great thing about having him as a co-founder, well, first of all, we're completely complementary. And that I think is really important. I think if we were doing the same things, it would probably lead to more difficulties but we have a a very defined responsibilities and whilst we'll rely on each other to make certain decisions it's it's very clearly delineated and i think that is really the key and i i don't think it's really necessarily important when you are married co-founders i think if you have a co-founder and then you're constantly doing you know, if, if if you're crossing over on too many things, it becomes really difficult. And it also becomes very difficult probably for the team to really understand who they should be coming to. And so that that sort of like, you know, dividing uh, responsibilities is super important. The other thing I think about having uh, my husband as co-founder is that we are completely aligned. So we don't really think about... Um, having a different agenda, if that makes sense. And not not that there's anything wrong with having a different agenda. You know, life happens. Um, You know, you've got a partner being moved to a different country with their job. You know, things like that can happen and they are very disruptive. So we have that perfect alignment, which is not to be overlooked when you have a co-founder. Because I have seen as a you know, board member uh, working with boards that often when things start getting really, really wrong is when there is no longer that perfect alignment. Mm. Well, hopefully you're not, you're not working into the night as, you know, as you, uh, you know, you're not working at home together and it's constantly 12. No, 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 not at all. And that's also part of uh, having to learn to, you know, be very, very clear um, and very strict that, you know, when, when work stops. Works then. Um, Well, just the final question I wanted to ask you is, what is um, a piece of, or what would you recommend to somebody who wants to have a similar career as yours? What would you say? I would say probably more than one thing, that's for sure. Um, I would say that having a good mentor is really important and reaching out. I do often say to my children, do send the email. The worst thing that could happen is they say no, Mm. you know, and I, uh, anyway, that's something to learn. You know, you you have to put yourself out there and rejection, failure is really important. That's how you learn. You don't learn from being successful at something. Not, not, not when you're an entrepreneur, you learn when you fail. Um, And it's weird because that's not necessarily obvious to begin with. Um, so I would say, yes, having a good mentor who can sort of say to you, it's okay, you know, you, you know, yes, you have to do this or give you feedback is really great. 
Um, one thing that I, um, I think I did well when I started my first business is that I, and I think it's because of my background in investment banking, I knew that I didn't want to have a business where there was a lot of risk. So I removed as much risk as possible. So I didn't want to go for, I could have gone for something which involved manufacturing, you know, having a production line and where you have to make a lot of very heavy investment up front. And then if it doesn't work, you, you know, you, you're kind of in a position where it's a bit harder. And for first, um, first dip into entrepreneurship, I just thought, let's just go for something which does not require a lot of, you know, capex. A lot of investment up front, which is what I did. And I'm glad I'm glad I went for this because that enabled me to actually thrive and grow the business very quickly. Yeah. Um seems like a very thriving industry. Um seems, yes, yes, be, yes. making the smart choices choices. You know, when I take on a new board position, uh, especially if it's a business that's, you know, starting, I always say, what is the risk that you can remove? You know, let's look at all of, you know, all the bits and pieces here that are involved in this business model and just remove as much risk as possible. Just let's, mm. let's do it bit by bit. Um, well, I won't keep you any longer. I imagine you're extremely busy and I uh, appreciate your time today. It was very, very interesting. And uh, I wish you all the best with um, Academia. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, yeah, see you again soon. See you. <laughs>